one thing that I, I caught in the comments there on the break um, was about the uh, scaling up issue in pharmaceuticals. Uh, it, you know, of course, I'm not in a position myself to answer those kinds of questions, but uh, I will say that um, those kind of questions have been asked um, a lot recently, and there is quite a bit of effort going into research that shows that urine use, well, looks into the use of urine on large scale and large scale collection. Um, Rich Earth Institute, to bring them up again, is heavily invested in this, as is the University of Michigan, I believe. Uh, if you go on their website, you can read about some of their research um, work that they've done in recent years. You can see that paper that I was referencing about the antibacterial resistant bacteria. So uh, we talked about urea and the hydrolysis of urea and how uh, urease, the enzyme, facilitates this breakdown into ammonium, hydroxide, and carbonate ions. Okay, so what happens when you apply this to your soil? Um, nitrifying bacteria come into play here. Now you've got ammonium, and uh, uh, of course that's, that's in water. That's in the water that's in your urine. And nitrifying bacteria would be across this line down here. Do the work of converting that ammonium into nitrates. Now, ammonium and nitrates both are uh, plant available sources of nitrogen. So, um, it, and I got into the weeds a little bit about this this morning and to a, a friend of mine talking about which, what would plants prefer? And um, from my understanding, and this is getting a little bit outside of my element, um, uh, most plants are going to prefer, at least your vegetable plants, are going to prefer nitrates um, to ammonium. Ammonium, I think, is um, preferred by some of the acid-loving crops, like um, you know maybe blueberries. I don't know that for a fact, but um, uh, nitrates are, are generally what we're looking for um, for a plant nutrient. Okay. So uh, I thought this would be fun. What better way to show nitrification at work than uh, to talk about saltpeter. Saltpeter. There's a, a fascinating, I'm going to go back in time here again. There's a, a fascinating story about saltpeter. Saltpeter being potassium nitrate salts used today in niche applications like uh, sensitive toothpaste, believe it or not. I think Sensodyne, the original Sensodyne, has saltpeter in it, uh, more broadly used as a fertilizer. Used in the past for curing meats. Um, it's actually what makes cured meats red in color. Um, but uh, some of you, I'm sure, already know, primarily used as an ingredient in black powder ammunition. Saltpeter is naturally made um, when these conditions are met. Uh, decaying organic matter. Alkaline base potash, maybe lime, maybe limestone. Uh, moisture, sufficient moisture, but not too much moisture. It needs to be sheltered from the sun and the rain. And uh, a free flowing air, free exposure to oxygen. Um, these are the conditions where nitrifying bacteria are going to thrive. Okay, this is on the floors and the walls of cellars, stables, um, limestone caves where uh, bat guano falls and lands on limestone, and it's nice and humid and moist in there. There's a little bit of air exchange. Um, in the south, now I wanted to show a photo, I, I ultimately left it out, but um, of, of a cave that my friends and I uh, go to around here. Sometimes we go into this cave, and it's a privately owned cave, and everybody's very respectful in there, but you can go in there and you can actually camp. And when you set up camp, you can see on the walls around your cave, um, you can see little saltpeter crust uh, forming on the walls. And uh, if you go in there, and, and I have a friend of mine who used to be a guide, and he could show you exactly where there are matted marks from where uh, children, presumably, would go into the caves and actually remove saltpeter out of the cave. And they were using this to make ammunition in the American Civil War. And... Um, 
the minister of war, whoever it was at the time, uh, commissioned a um, Joseph LeConte, a professor of chemistry at the University of South Carolina in 1862 to um, write a manual for landowners in the South on um, how they can create their own saltpeter out of concerns that this cave or stable sources of saltpeter were going to dry up and they needed saltpeter to continue the war. It is very important, therefore, that steps should be taken to ensure a sufficient and permanent supply of this invaluable article. This can only be done by means of niter beds. Um, so what I've done here is uh, set up a niter bed of my own at my house um, last year. So what you're seeing here is actually my niter bed, which you might recognize that as an IBC container. That's about 100 gallons in capacity. Uh, that was pretty much full of a manure, a woody-based manure compost, uh, not yet composted, but, but on its way. Uh, that I sourced and, and brought home and stuck it under my back porch shed roof where leaching is no longer an issue. And, um, and I began to urinate on it uh, all the time. <laughs> you know, a little bit every day if I could, or just whenever I was working in the yard, I could, I could urinate there. And um, what you want to do here is just basically keep it moist, but never, never, ever let it saturate. Never let it get too wet. Uh, you want to have a little drain there just in case it does start to pool. And um, again, that if it soaks and it's open to the air, we know we're going to start to lose ammonia um, to the air. And it's going to smell awful. So um, really, we want to make sure that it's not allowed to pool. And we want to keep it nice and fluffy and aerated and just adequately moist and out of the sun and the rain. And we want to facilitate the rotting of this manure by feeding it more and more nitrogen, getting those nitrifying bacteria to work for us. Over time, over about eight months of this, um, you can start to see this crust developing here on the outside of this manure. And basically, that's telling me that I'm, I'm, I'm saturated. I'm there. I'm building up uh, what I believe, and I don't know this for a fact, but I believe that that is ammonium nitrate crystals. Uh, at this point, I have not added very much wood ashes. I have added some wood ash, uh, but not yet. So what I've done here with this ammonium nitrate is uh, about a month before I'm ready to harvest, I will... Um, stop peeing on it completely. I'll let it dry up and I'll let this stuff crystallize on the outside. And what I did was scrape off maybe just the top four to six inches layer of this. And then I took that and mixed that pretty heavily with wood ashes. These really um, white, unleached, pure, fresh wood ashes that I got from my wood stove. And um, potassium is what you're looking for here. Now, potassium will leach out of your wood ashes if, it, if it's allowed to. So you want dry, pure wood ashes, white meaning it's low in organic matter. It's very reactive potassium. And um, I took that potassium and the, or the wood ashes, sorry, and the um, uh, material out of the niter bed, and um, I added hot water to it. And I wanted to get this right the first time. I'm not actually positive that you need to add hot water, but um, uh, I went ahead and did that and immediately raised the boiling point of this hot water. It was pretty fascinating. And, um, this bucket began to boil and froth and uh, lots of fizzing. Um, and what's happening there is the, um, uh, the ammonium nitrate. Now, I believe what's happening here is the ammonium nitrate is reacting with the potassium carbonate. And what you have here is all that stuff in suspension now in the, in the lay, what drips off of these containers uh, when, you, when allowed to, it, uh, the liquid's going to leach out of these little tiny holes in that bucket and it's going to fall, fall down here into this collection vessel. And uh, you're going to end up with this thick, syrupy brown lay uh, and plenty of dissolved salts and uh, chief among them is potassium nitrate. 
take that lay and you're going to boil it down. What you want to do is, is try to purify it as best as you can. And, and let, let me backtrack. This is all in that manual from Joseph Lacan, uh, which I've linked at the end of this presentation. Uh, you boil down that lay. Uh, uh, what's pretty cool here is that you're looking for different solubilities of the different salts. And potassium nitrate is unique in that it's very soluble in boiling water and it's less soluble in cold water. Um, much more soluble in boiling water than common sodium chloride. So what we're gonna do here is take that, that lay and boil it about halfway until you start to see a sediment form on the bottom of your pot. And then you're gonna take that lay and pour it off. And now, as that lay, lay referring to this liquid, um, starts to cool off, now you've, you've removed some or most of the sodium chloride and other salts. Now what's left behind as that water cools is it rapidly crystallizes. And that's what you're looking at in this bucket here. Or that, that's this lay after it's allowed to cool off. Uh, the next day I come in and pour off the liquid. Uh, and I'm left behind with a lot of really crude potassium nitrate crystals there. And pour off that remaining liquid, let it dry, and here you go. <laughs> Here's what I got. That's about half of my original yield. Notice the long uh, needle-like crystal shape. That is definitively potassium nitrate. Um, pretty cool stuff. It, um, has a really unique smell. It does not smell like urine at all. It smells, um, it smelled a lot like, and I expect maybe it's contaminated with the, with the potash, but it smells a lot like the potash. It has that kind of soft, uh, I want to say almost vanilla smell to it. There's a crude saltpeter. That's a better photo. Um, if you guys are interested in that whole process, I, I would say, not to promote myself any, any further here, but uh, shamelessly, I would say check out the Waste Not Wood Ashes series um you know there's a blog and there's there's videos out now too on it so um that goes into the soaking of wood ashes and then subsequently everything you can do with uh with the lay from that process the ash water um pretty pretty cool stuff um it's very similar to that process um between reading that and reading joseph lecant's work you should be all set to be able to do at least what i've done here um Lacan does go into methods of refining this um, uh, using blood as a flocculant, uh, it's quite a bit more detailed than something I'm willing to try to do at home. But um, anyway, what I have here, just to um, just to be clear, is uh, not really refined enough to do anything dangerous. But um, I do, I do want to show you what I ultimately did with it. Um, uh, which I, I'm quite proud of. And uh, I'll tell you a little story here, too, about the urine thing. I had a friend of mine that I told this to, and, and he reminded me of it earlier today, which was, which was quite fun. But um, I, in the side here, I've got a lot of, of kids in my neighborhood. I live in a nice little suburban, everybody's got their acre type uh, development. And um, a lot of kids running around. And and I, this is a, a major misjudge of, of character, but I um, assumed that the kids would kind of think that it was cool that I was making potassium nitrate from urine. I have never been more wrong in my life. Um, I am absolutely the neighborhood weirdo now. But um, let me show you what I did with it. Just to prove that it's worth something. This is a homemade smoke bomb that I made with potassium nitrate sourced from my own urine. This is New Year's Day. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> all right, let's get back to something serious here. <laughs> of course, we don't want to send all those nitrates up in the air. Um, this is waste not, after all. <laughs> 